Today on Inside Utah Politics, mailers under fire. The Utah Republican and Democratic parties are being called out for mailers they are funding in certain state races. Both party chairs are here to respond. Plus, students in the Salt Lake School District have been learning online all year while others are moving back and forth from in-person to online due to coronavirus outbreaks. Our panel debates the impact on education here in Utah. Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Thanks for joining us. I'm Glenn Mills. It is time to go inside Utah politics. We do begin today with Utah GOP Chair Derek Brown and Utah Democratic Party Chair Jeff Merchant. Gentlemen, great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Thanks. Glenn. Appreciate it. All right, uh, we're coming down the stretch. Things are getting ex exciting. Let's start off <laughs> with these mailers. Uh, many of in the public are calling them misleading. I want to get your take on them. Jeff, let's start with the one your party is sending out to various districts uh, that may be considered swing, uh, targeting Republican uh, lawmakers, this one, Mike Winder of West Valley. It says, Mike Winder's caucus voted to raise our taxes. He did nothing to stop it. Robert Gerke, Salt Lake Tribune columnist, saying this is a low blow and to be better. Uh, he voted no on this. Why did you guys take that approach? Well, you know, Glenn, I think that in this district, as well as numerous other districts, the fact of the matter is, is that we have a Republican supermajority that essentially has been running roughshod over the will and the desire of the people. One of the big problems that we have in the Utah legislature is that all of these decisions are made behind closed doors. We don't know what's spoken about. We don't know what's discussed. We don't know what's talked about. And then these bills are brought to the floor and voted on. So in a case like this, where a member of the Republican caucus may vote against it, we don't really know what their point of view is because they've been having that whole debate in, in secret. Okay, one real quick, Jeff, though. Yeah. Members of your own party, uh, Representative uh, Stoddard would be one of them, also Angela Romero would be another, came out and against this and said they didn't like using that tactic. Well, I guess that all I can say about that is that there's nothing misleading in these ads. There's nothing that prevents someone who receives this mailer from reading the mailer and then making the choice. This is really no different than the kind of thing that's been going on in this state and outside of this state for many, many years. Okay, uh, Derek, I'm gonna give you a chance to weigh in on that ad, but first let's bring up one that your party sent out. This is in Senate District 8, uh, one that kind of tends to go back and forth between the Republican and the Democrat. Uh, what do Bernie Sanders and Kathleen Reby have in common? It says they both have the second most liberal voting record in their respective Senate chambers. Now you reference a study done by Professor Adam Brown of BYU. He responded saying, I have performed no such comparison. Why did you do it? Well, so let's go back to the other question. I mean, specifically, you asked the Democrat, Chair, why is it that, that you did this? Is this, and he said, there's nothing misleading about this. And when you, have a, a, when you have a mailer that basically says that someone voted for something that they didn't in fact vote for, I mean, that is the very definition of misleading. Okay, Derek, I, I wanna give you time to respond to that, but let's, let's get back to this one first, because others thought that this was misleading and deceptive well. As I well. think when it comes down to the voting record that someone actually has mm -hmm. is, I mean, you can absolutely take someone to task for the voting record. That's what we're seeing. That's what we do as parties. That's part of the whole process is to say, look, there are voting records and, and people should be held accountable for that. I think in the terms of that mailer, I think the point was to show that the voting record itself is liberal. And, and frankly, I don't know why someone would be running away from the definition of liberal if you're, if you're a Democrat. I think that uh, in the same way that conservatives embrace the term conservative, I think liberals would do the same thing as well. And so well, I, I don't see anything necessarily misleading about it at all. The author of the study did, so that's why I wanted to bring it up. And to be honest with you, it could be counterproductive when you consider Bernie Sanders won two presidential elections in the state of Utah and did pretty well in that district. Okay, Derek, now let's turn our attention back to the uh, tax reform uh, the mailer. Mailer yeah. and your thoughts. You started getting into them there, but finish your thoughts. Well, I think, th as I said, it's, it's important to sort of call people to task for votes they cast. I mean, my concern with the mailer is it was calling someone to task for a vote that they never cast. I mean, when you say, as this mailer said, this person, in that case, Representative Winder or Representative Elison or any of the others who voted for or, or did not vote for the tax actually did. I mean, that's the it problem. Doesn't say I mean, I think you have that, to Derek. be fair. What, when you say what, they did nothing, I mean, I would think voting against 
voting against a bill, uh, it seems to me that is doing something. What about I mean, Jeff's in fact, point, something though, really big. What about Jeff's point, though, Derek, that these conversations on the Republican side are happening behind closed doors, and we don't really know what those members what their role was in playing that because but caucuses think, often close. But I think that's a nuance that, that, that I, people don't see, and that's not the point of the mailer, is for someone to look at that and think, oh, well, there's this nuance, and behind closed doors, the caucus may have done this or that or the other. And people don't even know sometimes what the word, I've had people say, what does that mean by caucus? I think ultimately, if someone votes against a bill and you say, no, they voted for it, that's the whole takeaway from the mailer. So that's why I had an issue with that mailer is, is the takeaway was this person voted for a bill. In other words, they did nothing to stop the very thing that they voted to stop. I mean, that for me, is, I think that's misleading. And so I think, I think it's okay to, to be fair about what someone actually voted for, but when you're misrepresenting that, then I think it's fair to call uh, that out. Jeff, d delve into that a little more because yeah. that has also been brought up by that same logic those in the Democratic Party did the same thing to do nothing to stop it by the definition that they voted no but didn't do anything else. I think that ultimately, though, uh, the, the difference is, is that the people that voted no, as well as the people that are running against those people that are on the Republican side that voted no, but we don't know what they said behind closed doors, all went out, they all signed the, the tax referendum, they all went out and gathered additional signatures. You saw for the vast majority on the Democratic side, people that continued to fight to try and stop this awful tax bill from being passed. Now look, here's the bottom line. The, the problem that, uh, that Derek is raising doesn't apply in this situation because no one ever said that these individuals actually voted for it. The problem that most Democrats, and frankly, I think a lot of independents in the state of Utah have with the legislature, is this paternalistic attitude towards voters. They always think that they know better, and they always think that they can do things better than the voters do. Okay. In four instances this last year, the voters said they wanted one thing, and the legislature came in and did something else. And now what we're being told is that the voter can't even read a piece of paper that they're mailed and understand what that means. Well, can I add to that, though? I mean, yes. if, if the mailer says they did nothing to stop it, and they voted to stop it, I mean, how do you, I mean, what they did behind closed caucus doors or what the Democrats did behind their closed caucus doors seems okay. to me that's, frankly, that's irrelevant. I mean, it's just misleading. But I mean, Glenn, you're saying something is Glenn. when Gentlemen, it isn't. Gentlemen, our, our, our time is really going quick here. Jeff, I want to get your thoughts on this mailer that we also brought up, sent out by the sure. GOP. So I think that that's where, um, you know, Derek and I really differ because in this other case, uh, we're not talking about nuances like it seems like we're talking about with this Democratic mailer. We're talking about misusing someone's words, sending that out to people into a district, and then having the person whose words were actually used saying on Twitter, stop doing this. Now, I think that it's ironic that I'm being accused of being misleading when there's actually a person out there whose words have been misused and is saying, you're being misleading about my words. Well, so, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take a step here and say, gentlemen, that I think a lot of people look at both of them as misleading. Your thoughts? Uh, well, yeah, my, my thoughts are, my own members of my party have said, look, this is a legitimate comparison. And I think when you have, the difference here is the Democrats' own elected officials have said this is a low blow, this is embarrassing. I, one of them said, I can't believe they would stoop this low. And so when you have the Democrats' own elected officials turning and running as fast as they can from what the party has done, I think that's probably the single best indicator of whether in fact, I mean, the folks who are literally on the ballot this year, if they're the ones saying we want nothing to do with this, I think that's a pretty good indication okay. of, of where things stand. We have about 30 seconds left. Uh, Jeff, your final word. Sure, you know, I think that that's actually the beauty of the Democratic Party is that we continue to have discussions about whether things are right or wrong and how that works. And uh, sure, we may have some differences of opinion, but at the end of the day, I think that this Republican mailer is far more misleading than anything that the Democrats have done this year. Okay, uh, our time went quick. I wanted to get into some <laughs> other things, but that was an important conversation and I really appreciate both of your perspectives and really uh, getting into this one. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. All right, still to come, the Justice Department taking aim at Google, saying the tech giant is stifling competition. The latest on the lawsuit.
Plus, packing the Supreme Court has become a key issue of this election. What Senate Republicans are doing to try to put it to rest for good. Welcome back. The Justice Department filing a lawsuit against Google claiming the tech giant is violating antitrust laws. Washington correspondent Alexandra Lamone has details on why some say the Trump administration's lawsuit could be politically motivated. The Justice Department claims Google's search service is an unlawful monopoly. In a statement, Attorney General William Barr said this lawsuit strikes at the heart of Google's grip over the Internet. The Trump administration's lawsuit says Google uses billions of dollars to ensure it's the default search engine people see, and that hurts competitors. The Justice Department says Google's practices hurt consumers by limiting options and hurt small businesses by raising advertising prices. Google's senior VP of Global Affairs responded by calling the lawsuit flawed and said the lawsuit could raise phone prices and make it harder for people to get services they want. The idea that the Google search is the alpha and omega of all search is not just absurd, it's patently false. NetChoice is a trade association that represents online platforms, including Google. Vice President Carl Zabo says search engines like Bing, Yelp, Angie's List, and Yahoo are proof consumers have other options. Zabo says the lawsuit could be a political move just weeks before the election. Political pressure on platforms that Google runs and political pressure to other platforms saying if you don't fall in line, we're going to come after you too. If successful, the lawsuit could force parts of Google's businesses to be broken off and run separately. In Washington, Alexandra Limon. Six Senate Republicans introducing a constitutional amendment to prevent Democrats from packing the Supreme Court if Joe Biden wins the White House and Democrats take the majority in the Senate. The proposed amendment states that the Supreme Court shall be composed of only nine justices. Washington correspondent Anna Warnicke reports on how Republicans are trying to push this through Congress just days before the election. Texas Republican Senator Ted Cruz wants to prevent Democrats from expanding the Supreme Court. Cruz and five Senate Republicans introduced a constitutional amendment that simply says the Supreme Court of the United States shall be composed of nine justices. There's nothing in the Constitution that says how many justices are on the Supreme Court. That number is up to Congress. Cruz also introduced a bill requiring a two-thirds supermajority in the Senate to change the court size in the future. For amendment to become law, it would need two-thirds approval in both the House and the Senate, as well as support from 38 states. Anthony Markham with the R Street Institute says that's a very high bar. That's just simply not going to happen, especially on an issue as politically contentious as on the Supreme Court. So these are, these are messaging bills. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden has dodged questions on whether he supports adding justices to the Supreme Court. Joe, the American people deserve a straight answer. Vice President Mike Pence said Monday that Biden's silence is evidence he plans to pack the court with liberal justices. They do have a right to know where I stand. I'll have a right to know where I stand before they vote. Biden says his position will depend on how Republicans handle the confirmation of Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Cruz says that uncertainty is why the Senate needs to take action now. In Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. Coming up, the spike in COVID cases has Utah schools scrambling to keep students safe. But what impact is it having on learning? Our panel debates after the break. You're watching Inside Utah Politics. 
Time now to dig deeper into some of the big stories of the week with the Inside Utah Politics panel. This week we have State Senator Karen Main and Salt Lake Tribune columnist Michelle Quist. Ladies, great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks very much. Good to be here. Let's start with uh, school and education in Utah amid the pandemic. Schools opening, closing, some have been online all this time, others going back and forth. Senator, let's start with you. What are you seeing in your district? How is this impacting education in Utah? Well, it, it's really a, a problem uh, for us. I have all Granite School District. I have a very diverse area. And we have, uh, we have um, like I say, lots of diversity, different cultures, and we have a lot of uh, families that two people work. And in some of the homes, they don't have the, the internet that they have, that they should have, and so they have problems that way. So Granite School District, and we've been working together with the elected officials to try to help with that. It's, it's really an issue, and that's why Granite really has uh, been the forefront of to get the kids back to school, because they see, uh, the last thing that I was told by Granite School District, 30% of those computers were never opened. Michelle, let's bring you in. You have uh, children in the Salt Lake School District, one that has been online the entire time. Your thoughts on how education and is going in the impact of the pandemic? You know, as they said about the debates, it's a hot mess in a dumpster fire in a train wreck. Honestly, it is just not working. I have five kids in the Salt Lake City School District doing online learning and you know the, the oldest one is able to um, be successful but the younger ones just they just can't do it they can't you know there's there's technical problems there's internet problems there's um, it, they, they just don't have the motivation to sit there and and do the work they're getting F's on tests and nothing's being done about it and it, it's just not working so what's the solution there then I my kids go to school in the Canyon School District They've been in school for two weeks, then online for two weeks, now back in school. And so there's a lot of back and forth in some districts. I would just say, I don't think there is a solution. I think we just have to do what we need to do until at the end of the year when we have a vaccine until the first of the year. I think we just, because it changes every day and the situation in the schools change. I think we just need to, this is this really is a stinky, sucky year, and it's a bummer. And those are the things that are happening. So we're all in it together. I think we just need to be flexible and mobile because we don't, we just don't know. And uh, I think the solution, there is no solution. We just need to do what we need to do until there's, there's a vaccine and we have a new direction. Michelle, do you think the Salt Lake School District needs to get going on in-person learning? I do, I do. I think the teachers are doing their best to, to try hard as, as it is, but it's not working and, and, and you know, we, I live in a very privileged household. We have all the computers and the internet. A lot of kids don't and the solution, uh, you, know, like, you know, like the Senator said, there, there is no good solution, but we should at least be trying the optimum uh, choice and, and that would be in in-person learning to start. Senator, you, you brought up the students in your district that maybe don't have the internet connection. Right. The parents are uh, working while the students are at home. Are you worried that the uh, disparity gap is growing even more yes. among those students? Yes, I am. And I think it's not even in my district, even those more affluent districts, they have an issue too, because they have motivated children and non-motivated children. It's really hard for families because as Michelle said, one of her, her children is motivated, one's not. So here the parents are trying to work with everyone them so they can be successful. The answer is, we, when it hopefully the end of the year, the first of the year, we can all get back. But I, it's very difficult. People just need, need to be mobile. They need to be flexible. And we're all living through this. And there's, I wish there was a good answer, and there's not. And I, uh, I support the the state boards. I support the parents. But we need to work together. It's not. We cannot be divisive, or we will. We've got a handful of months. We have to work together. And I hope that that happens and not be divisive. Okay, okay. Michelle, did you have anything well, else you wanted to yeah, finish up with there? Yeah, we're not even talking about the other effects that are happening, you know, on families and, and mothers and jobs. And, you know, they're, they're calling it a she session. I had to take a leave of absence. I, I can't, you know, I can't help five kids with school and, and be working at the same time with all the Internet issues. And it's just it's just practically impossible. And we're ignoring all of those. Um, all of those side effects that are also going on. Yeah, and as you mentioned earlier, uh, you're in a situation where you can do that. Other parents, they simply can't. No. All right, I want to move on to another topic. We had the chairs of both parties 
uh, in earlier on the show talking about what many saw as misleading mailers going out to uh, certain s uh, state races. I want to talk to you two about your vision for your party here in the state of Utah. Are things, uh, are, is DC politics entering into Utah more and more? Senator, let's go ahead and start with you again. I think you're getting outside PACs and you're getting outside decision makers that are affecting all the races. You can see that with the congressional race that we're in. Uh, at the end, they say really, really fast, this is the PAC, blah, 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 blah. So it's on both sides, and I don't think there's not a lot of control there. Uh, and I think that's, that's not helpful, especially in the state of Utah. Uh, yes, we've had some mailers on both sides go out. I don't think that's helpful either. Um, and there are, uh, we can speak to that, of the effective, or there are not. It's just where you fall, fall there, uh, fall on that decision making. But I'm concerned that more and more of that is happening. And uh, I was uh, uh, interested and surprised and happy with the gubernatorial uh, candidates that came out. I thought that took courage and I appreciate that. Michelle, your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think there is more national interference with, with our races here. Um, I, you know, there's negative mailing every election. Every election we have a conversation about civility and we have a conversation about um, negative mailers. But there is an opportunity here for the Republican Party to um, be better, to remind Utah that there is a Utah way, that we like being positive, that there's no reason to, um, you know, be, be calling out negative things of the other person. If you have a, if you have a message and, and if you have, you know, something you want to share, share it. There's, there's no need to d demean the other person. And, and voters appreciate that, and I think we have an opportunity to, to get back to that. Yeah, this didn't get quite as much fanfare or even near, anywhere near it, but back in 2018 in the 3rd Congressional District, we saw Representative uh, John Curtis and his opponent James Singer come out and do a similar campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, changing demographics in Utah, are Utahns starting to reject extremes more and more on both sides and becoming more independent? Well, I find uh, in my district, my district is unaffiliated. I have Democrats and I have Republicans and everybody else is unaffiliated. I think you're getting more and more. I have a purple area and I think those red areas are going purple. I think people are free thinkers. I'm a Democrat, uh, the senator in my area. I have Republicans underneath me. So that tells me that they're voting for the individual. And I think you're seeing much more of that in Salt Lake County. I think people don't, um, I they can choose if, if they want to be affiliated with the party but I think many of them are not. They're just free thinkers. They want that person in with their ideals that they're comfortable with. Your thoughts, Michelle, on the demographic in Utah, and is it changing? I, I think it is changing. There are studies that show that it is changing. And, you know, especially with age, where voters are getting younger and, um, you know, new workers are, are moving into the state and their age is younger. And, you know, if, if the Republican Party is a party of, of liberty and um, prosperity, then that is for younger voters, it, it has to be liberty and prosperity for all, for all races, for all colors. And you know, if the Republican Party doesn't stand for that, then they're gonna lose out on those voters. Senator Maine, what could the Utah Democratic Party do to reach out to more of the purple voter as you described? I, I think they just need to look at our makeup. Uh, in the House and the Senate, who are they looking at? Women. Women, uh, the Democratic Party is very um, appealing to women. We don't have a problem with that. And in leadership, uh, we have women. I'm the minority caucus. Uh, I think they can see in the Democratic Party we're open. Uh, anyone can be there. We are uh, supportive and, and welcoming to everyone. I think it's evident, and you see that in the mix of, of, uh, of the elected officials in the Capitol. Okay, Michelle, I'll give you the last 20 seconds. You're a former uh, officer of the Utah GOP. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on what the senator just said? Oh, I, I completely agree. The Republican Party needs to recruit and fund more women candidates, more female candidates. I have seen too many charts and advertisements this round about um, you know all the candidates from the GOP and, and you've, you've got 10 candidates there on, on a flyer and they're all white and they're all male. And okay. it's just not good enough anymore. In the Republican Party, we do need more women. We're going to have to end it on that note, ladies. Uh, great conversation. Thanks for being here. Thanks very here. much. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more Inside Utah Politics right after the break.
We leave you now with a look at what's on the radar in the world of politics. State officials are encouraging you to vote by mail this year. Make sure to have your ballot postmarked by Monday, November 2nd. Election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Check with your local county clerk for in-person early and election day options. And make sure to connect with me on social media. I'd like to know what you think of this show and other issues that are important to you. You can email me at InsideUtahPolitics at ABC4.com. You can also follow me and interact with me on Twitter and Facebook. Just log on and search Glenn Mills ABC4. Thanks so much for making us part of your day. We hope to see you again next week as we go Inside Utah Politics.